So uh, I want to start off with there's a lot of pressure on me today. This is the first time my wife has decided to show up in a talk that I'm giving, so I'm like really stressed out. <laughs> All right, so uh, just remember that at the end and give me an applause. Uh, let's start. So I wanted to take you back in sort of the 2000 to 2010 time frame. Um, and think about the time where you know, checks came in mail. And when, when a check came in mail, what that meant was you had to make a trip to this wonderful, wonderful place. You had to you know, fill a form, um, stand in line, and deposit the check. right? And uh, somewhere in 2009, US AA Bank introduced the first mobile deposit application. And uh, I was talking to a customer of ours, uh, who's a big bank on the West Coast here, and they were, uh, they were talking to me because they were going through their digital transformation. And uh, uh, they quoted this, this uh, mobile deposit as the reason why, why they were going for, uh, for their digital transformation. So what their story was, when, they st the, when this application came out, everyone looked at this, all the banks looked at this with sort of uh, as a novelty feature, everybody was amused. And even as recently as 2013, peop, there were only 10% banks that were doing mobile deposits. And then something happened, right? Uh, uh, it's almost considered table stakes at the moment to have this mobile deposit feature, right? How many of you actually use the mobile deposit feature to deposit checks? Yeah, pretty much the entire room, right? So from this bank's perspective, what happened was it no longer was sufficient that they were sort of catering to their customers for the last 50 years or so. They could actually lose business because they did not have the mobile deposit feature. So what that meant was uh, they got a SWAT team together, the team of developers and came together, they built the feature out, and they released the feature in record time, right? all high fives around the room, you know, success. But this was uh, really the start of, uh, of a journey, right? Because it was very apparent to them that delivering one feature on time just once isn't going to cut it, right? There are tons of services that competition is always releasing all the time. So whereas they, were, they had just released one feature, um, what they were looking at was consistently releasing newer and newer versions of this application, and not just this application, but a whole fleet of applications across their entire portfolio, right? And they weren't equipped to do that. Now, if you talk to um, you know, analysts such as Gartner, they seem to agree. According to them, the uh, nonstop demand is the number one problem that's facing the IT departments today. Right? And there are a number of organizations out there set up to actually help you or agree with this premise, right? Right from McKinsey's of the world who are running their own digital transformation to you know, guys like us. And everybody seems to agree that continuous delivery is the key, is the answer to make this happen, right? You heard uh, Kosuke in his keynote talking about continuous deliveries here and real. You, talk, you know, heard Sasha. And I completely agree with that. I think in the next four to five years, almost every application that's being delivered is going to be delivered through continuous delivery, right? So as CloudBees, we have a number of customers, and Sasha talked about some, who are actually using our platform to deliver stuff faster and with better quality, right? So guys like Newstar, which is a billion-dollar company, Orbitz, and Morningstar. Uh, and continuous delivery and faster delivery actually means a whole lot of different things to different people, right? Uh, for Morningstar, it was cutting down from hours to minutes. For somebody like Newstar, it was, uh, I think, you know, days to multiple times in a day, right? It's a journey, and that's where, you know, Sasha pointed about the DevOps Express part. But what we have consistently noticed is, on an average, our customers, when they bring in the CloudBees Jenkins platform, release, uh, you know, experience about six times improvements in, in their delivery cycles. Right. And what about this bank, right? So they are they're going through that digital transformation. They started about you know, two and a half years back. They have CloudBees Jenkins platform in there, and they're fairly successful with that. But lest you thought that 
just this bank is, is one unicorn out there. Pretty much, you know, 10 of the Fortune 100 banks out there are using CloudBeast to deliver faster. So what do we offer? And Sasha touched upon this in his keynote. But at the core of everything that we do is Jenkins Project, right? That's why this man is here. Um, we, we have you know, introduced this Jenkins Enterprise Distribution. I think of this as what Red Hat did with Fedora, we are doing with Jenkins. And we have built these enterprise features around security, manageability, analytics, and scalability around it. And uh, this is available on multiple platforms. And more recently, we've released the private SaaS edition, which Sasha demoed on the stage with the, with the 2000 masters, right? And all of this is backed by stellar support. And support does not just include fixes to issues, but it does also um, include questions like, how do I scale Jenkins, right? And all of this is actually built around Jenkins 2.0. Starting today, we've announced the GA of the CloudBeast Jenkins platform around Jenkins 2.0. Private SaaS edition is, does include CJP 2.0. So all of this with Jenkins 2.0, so it's all pipeline-centric. So for the rest of the talk, what we want to do is, uh, what I wanted to do is help you sort of understand what you can do today uh, so that you can walk out and, uh, oh, wow. Uh, so you can walk out and actually bring something in right away. And then we wanted to paint a picture of where we are taking CloudBees and Jenkins forward. And, and Kosuke talked a lot about where Jenkins is going forward. And I wanted to, you know, him to talk about how he sees us taking CloudBees product line going forward. So the key question is, how do you take a butler, which is so great, and, and make him into Jarvis? Right? So we think of this on, on five themes or five pillars. Uh, the number one theme is rock solid Jenkins, right? So um, a question here, uh, what happens if your production instance of Jenkins goes down? Right, it's, it's kind of nervous, right? It makes you nervous. The entire software delivery pipeline kind of clogs up and you have tons of people within the organization screaming at you. And so, well, no surprise, Jenkins is mission critical. 92% of you told us last year that it is. And so we take that fairly, fairly seriously, right? So uh, we've hired, as CloudBees, we've hired a number of key contributors on Jenkins on our team and who have been going out and contributing to open source all the time. But in the last year, as we've grown, we've actually upped our game here, right? So Kosuke talked about the, the security team under Daniel uh, that works in open source. Uh, Daniel is in our team. But we, what we've done is we've pulled together a team of, uh, a SWAT team of security guys that actually work under the ages of uh, the open source security team. So this, this is sort of your men in black going out and protecting you. And uh, we do these uh, enterprise security releases all the time that's available to our customers and, um, our, uh, and, and in open source as well. But then when we looked at this, you know, when we looked at the context of how can we make Jenkins even more rock solid than what it is, there were two very obvious things that you know, people brought to us. And, and Sasha alluded to this in his keynote. So in some ways, I feel like Jenkins is a victim of its own success, right? The, the plugin ecosystem that we talk about, uh, it's like a plugin bazaar, right? It is, it is huge, um, it's fantastic, but just like any bazaar out there, there is a variance in the quality of stuff that you get, right? So a plugin from Kosuke will have lower quality as compared to a plugin from Harpreet, right? <laughs> so, so there's the quality issue, and it manifests itself in multiple ways, right? So one is if you're upgrading your Jenkins, if you're upgrading the core, uh, sorry, this plugin, um, does it upgrade right? Does it bring in instability to Jenkins itself? Um, and uh, does it keep, you know, be consistent across upgrades? So in, in version 2.0 of the plugin, if the developer introduced a new feature, um, does it sort of break the previous contract? So that's one. The second uh, problem is, is around just the, the frequency of upgrades that are coming in, right? 
And uh, there's a weekly release that comes out. Most enterprises stick to this um, four releases a year called the long-term support release that comes out. Um, and actually, CloudBees, we built around these, you know, these LTS releases. But with each of these release and with the pro plug-in problem that I talked about, there's a huge variability in, you know, um, in, in terms of the choices that a administrator needs to make as they bring in Jenkins, right? So the way I think about this problem is, uh, if you're a Jenkins administrator, uh, you know that when you're upgrading Jenkins or a particular plugin, it's almost like you're driving on this sort of narrow road. If you do things right, they're best practices. We recommend those best practices all the time. You do the things right, you have a sandbox, you upgrade things, you test things together. Everything should work fine and you should make, make your way across. Uh, if one wrong turn and you could be off the cliff and it, then it takes you a while to kind of get back to, you know, to your feet. So what we wanted to do was we actually wanted to build this paved road this, you know, and just make it, as Sasha said, excitingly boring for you. Like an upgrade from one version to another should, should be in a non-event, right? That's what we want to do. And so the CloudBees Jenkins Enterprise uh, uh, product that Sasha talked about is really, really geared towards it, right? What Red Hat does to Fedora, uh, CJE is, is to open source Jenkins. And uh, Kosuke and me have been working on this project for, for a year now, right? And so our key sort of North Star in this has been stability. So stability is the North Star, and there are a few key goals, right? One, I like to think about it as no fear upgrades. So if you're upgrading, there should be no fear. Um, so that's, and, and the second one is I would like to give Jenkins administrator their weekends back. So that, that has been our goal as we've gone through this, this effort. So what we've done is, is pulled together a team of, I would like to say, Avengers. And, and these guys come in and they're fighting their bar, you know, your battles for you. They're kind of going through all the stuff that you should have, you would have done till today you know, on your behalf. And so how, how do we bring that in, right? So we are, you know, we are bringing in like unprecedented level of testing of uh, open source plugins and core. Um, I come from the J2EE, Java EE land, and the closest I can think about was the sort of the extensive test, uh, you know, TCK suite that we built there, right? So in this case, what we've done with the first release is we've picked a set of plugins across various categories, brought that in, and these, all of these have been tested together. More importantly, we have examined the quality of each. If there are tests missing, we have gone ahead and wrote those tests. We've done functional tests, we've done integration tests, and, and we're making sure that all of this sort of comes up and has been tested well together and plays well together. And any of the uh, you know, changes that we do, we are contributing this to uh, open source. So in general, we are improving the rock solidness nature of Jenkins. And all of this is available, yes? Is this available right away? That's the question. Yeah, yeah, it's right away. We commit uh, uh, fixes upstream right away. So all of this is available as part of an envelope that we built together, uh, that we built. And this envelope is delivered to you and uh, oh, as CloudBees, what we're com you know, committing to is just a rolling releases of these envelopes that are consistently being delivered to you, right? So as time goes by, this envelope will get fatter and fatter, and there'll be more and more plugins in there sort of helping you, you know, uh, uh, upgrade with these. So whereas in the past, customers used to come in, Whereas in the past, uh, customers would come in and ask us uh, about qualities of certain plugins. And uh, you know, I would think of this as the, the universe of plugins. And we could just give them anecdotal evidence on what the quality of the plugins are. Um, today, we can actually think of this in two tiers. So we can tell customers there's a CloudBees verified version where the risk of upgrading is minimal. 
and then there's the rest of the universe which is fairly similar to what you have today. And uh, we've actually gone ahead and built, uh, we've actually gone ahead and built uh, an assistant called the Beekeeper Upgrade Assistant, right? And what this does, it simplifies your life as an administrator while you're trying to upgrade. Um, whereas today, if you're upgrading, you're thinking in terms of there's a core upgrade and there's 50 plugins, and I need to worry about you know each of these plugins, how I can upgrade those. That just completely goes away, right? Uh, what you get is one choice, and you can just upgrade the entire envelope and rest assured that everything in the envelope just comes up, right? So that's that's something that we're uh, doing, and it's available in two flavors. Uh, flavor one is somewhat more traditional, what I like to call this fixed release model, which is what we do today. And uh, uh, it caters to two personas. So if you are this, uh, 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 this organization that cares about stability, and that's what you care about, you don't care about new features, that's what you sort of go and stick to. And then the other model which we are releasing today is called the rolling release model which is a cater to the persona where you want not only fixes to come in, but you also want new features coming in. So I'm gonna take a moment and just move this out of the way. All right. Yeah, can we, can we park the questions to the end, if you don't mind? So, from a customer perspective, if you're the fixed release persona, what you do is nothing different than what you've done today, is you pick up the uh, LTS that we are on, and then we release these patch releases ever so often, and you're on that. And if you wanted a new feature to come in your way, you actually have to wait for the new, the next LTS to come in, right? So it's absolutely, you care about stability, and that's all, you know, that's what you get. In the rolling release model, the circles here are bigger because it's coming at a reg, you know, because it has new features and fixes, right? And this includes the course and plugin. And it's released at a regular cadence of think about four to eight weeks. Um, and uh, that's how frequently you'll get it. Uh, one key thing here is as we talk to a number of organizations, they mention to us that their typical upgrade patterns with uh, Jenkins is they don't upgrade you know, every week or month or two months, but when they do upgrade, they want to get to the latest and the greatest. So with this, Kaden, with this model, you know, we are telling customers that they don't have to kind of upgrade on every cadence release. So what we are doing is we are doing an unprecedented level of upgrade testing between each of these releases. So if you're on the first LTS and you decide to skip, uh, skip the next three releases and you get to the fourth, that upgrade is guaranteed to work, right? I don't have the VP of engineering here, so I can say guaranteed to work. So it's guaranteed to work, right? So you can easily upgrade, and you can uh, uh, get those new features as well. So the goal here with this release for us has been this, this curated garden for you. We build this curated garden, you come into it, and everything is guaranteed to work together all the time, right? The next thing is really, sort of make this a paved road, so upgrades are no longer an issue, right? Um, no fear upgrades, and uh, Jenkins administrators get to sleep in the, in the night, right? That's, that's really what we are trying to do here. So it's available on the CloudBees Jenkins platform today. So if you are a CloudBees customer, this comes as part of CJP 2.0. Uh, and as Sasha mentioned that uh, we are also working towards a pilot, we are working on a pilot program where we are thinking of offering CJE, the Jenkins Enterprise Distro by itself. So that's the URL. If you register, uh, you can be part of the pilot program. If you register today, you get this uh, Iron Man Jenkins uh, T-shirt, and there are only 200 of those, so even you don't get one. So, uh, uh, so you get that. So moving on, the, the next uh, pillar of investment for us has been WebScale Jenkins, and you saw that on the 2000 master uh, thing that we showed up there. But uh, if you have seen me and Kosuke do this dance over the last few years, uh, you'll hear this consistent theme. When, when we started CloudBees, what we saw was 
customers kind of going and building their own Burj Khalifa, right? There was one giant master, and this giant master uh, uh, was, you know, supported the entire organizations. And we actually had customers who would come in and say there are issues, and we would provide them fixes, and they would say, like, well, no, I'm not going to upgrade because it's going to bring my, uh, you know, I can, I'll have to bring my master down. So a few years ago, we started with the CJP platform, and we started talking about, hey, what you want to do is think about you know, the six-floor or eight-floor level skyscrapers. These are around your teams, and these teams can sort of um, be on their, uh, on their own masters, and they will not sort of interrupt each other. But I think the times have changed. And, and a good uh, story here is another you know, financial company out here in the West Coast where they decided that uh, their CEO was coming down to them with lots and lots of initiatives, and they couldn't respond to those initiatives. And uh, every time a new initiative came down, you know, their developers kind of sort of had this look, right? So what they decided to do is uh, they wanted to build their own CD as a service platform. And in my conversations with them, I realized it took them about two to three million dollars, and about a year and a half at the minimum, just to get the first version out. And I'm not even talking about the operational costs of the Snowflake. So I was, as I was looking at this, I realized, like, you know, it's, you're like a snail. You've not even started the initiatives that the CEO has talked about. And it's a year and a half. And your competition is just looming in the back as this truck ready to crush you, right? And that was the goal of why we started doing PSC, is because we started seeing a lot of organizations trying to do this thing. So, our goal really was to be zero to production in 60 minutes. So if you saw Sasha in the keynote starting that cluster, that cluster up, I've confirmed with the engineering, is up. It's on its way up, but I think it should be up by now. So it was really about getting you to set this cluster up within an hour, right? So think about it. The time it takes you to go from San Jose to San Francisco, you have a, a CD as a service set up versus the year and a half it would take you to do it by yourself. The second thing we wanted to do was we just didn't want to stop at setting up the you know, cluster. Right? Administrators out there want to bring on teams to service things, right? So onboarding a new organization should be in minutes, and Sasha actually demoed it. It was less than a minute there. And that, that's not really it. It should really be about onboarding multiple organizations in minutes. And that's what uh, uh, we've done with, uh, with PSC, right? And all this was highly available. You again saw that in the demo. Um, something went wrong. If you were using pipelines, your developers would not even know about it. Your administrator is not getting any pager alerts. So you end up with a happier and more productive team. And uh, well, you know, we've bragged enough about this, right? So we've scaled this to 2,000 masters and 8,000 executors, and it can go up, actually. So under, if you peel the hood underneath it, uh, what you see is, uh, um, we are using Docker containers, um, and that's what was attaining this, the multi-tenancy. So what, what, what we are doing here is we are actually taking care of the multi-tenancy for you as well. That customer that I talked about, they weren't doing any master sort of multi-tenancy at all. So the next uh, pillar, right, it's one thing to, to run things at... Uh, scale, the other one, there's an entirely different class of problems on operating this at scale. So what we've done here is, uh, over the period of the last few years, we've built the CloudBees Jenkins platform to have something called the Operations Center. And what the Operations Center does is uh, it helps you manage all these masters. It's your single pane of glass into various masters. And you can do things like sharing of build nodes. So whereas in the past, you had, you know, um, uh, build nodes on each of these masters, you could now consolidate and across organizations and reduce costs. Uh, we built in security, uh, so it's based on, it's called the Rose-based access control plugin, which manages security across the organization. So before this, each of these masters within the organization would have their own sort of security, but now you can hand it to a central team who can you know, uh, bring in uniform uh, security across the organization. Each of these masters can choose to install you know, any set of plugins, right? So with the custom update center feature, what we did is we can get the central admin to, to provision one update center per team 
or one up update center across the cluster. It's really up to them. And then we build something called cluster operations. And what it does is you as a central administrator can run op you know, administrative operations across your entire cluster at one single time. Another area that's been very popular with our customers is, is called templates. And what we've done here is I think of this as two use cases. One is administrators uh, is from a developer perspective, right? So it's, it's about uh, a low cognitive load to your developers. So if I'm a developer, all I care about is I just want to point to my GitHub URL and everything else should be taken care of from a configuration perspective on the job. And so with templates, you kind of get that. You get, create a job based on a template, and all you have to worry about is the few things that your administrator cares about. And from an administrative perspective, what ends up happening is uh, uh, you can centrally manage this again. So I can, as an administrator, make an update to a particular template, and all the jobs in the organization that depend on that template kind of uh, uh, get updated at the same time. And then um, we built uh, uh, these analytics features and on a number of facets, and one of them is build analytics. So we kind of come in and try to help you on the capacity planning and troubleshooting in case of you know, something like, why are some machines red? You know, is, is, a, is this a problem with the my Mac cluster or something like that? So we kind of build that in. And, and in the PSC land, what we've done is we've actually built this, uh, a, a Docker infrastructure underneath it, as I said. And what happens here is you as an administrator can choose sort of the Docker containers for your masters and roll that out. You can choose Docker containers for, for your developers and standardize on that. You could let your developers specify their Docker containers and do their own builds. So we've built that as well. I'm really running behind on time, aren't I? All right. So the, the next vector that we've uh, invested in is uh, continuous delivery. And uh, I feel very close to this. It, pretty much every, everything on this bullet in open source has, uh, I've been involved with. So I'm going to sp skip most of this because uh, there are individual sessions that do more justice to the topic than what I can do. So I'd recommend going into Jesse's session, Patrick's session, and James Dumay's session. Um, and, and learn more about it. So uh, to complete sort of what's available today for you from, uh, from us is we do ops at scale and continuous delivery, right? Um, anything around these vectors and we help you. And all of this is based on Jenkins 2.0. So let's look at what we are planning to do in the next, uh, you know, the next uh, few years. <clears throat> So as Kosuke talked about in his co keynote um, on the UX front, we came to the realization that Jenkins, we could only make it you know, move so much forward with delta changes, right? It is all things to all people, whether you're an administrator, whether you are a developer, you log into the same Jenkins screen and you get, get to consume it. So with Blue Ocean, we took a decidedly opinionated path forward. So what you see in Blue Ocean is, is uh, a very developer persona. It's right, really trying to get developers to be productive. And what this lets us do is start thinking in, on the, the CloudBees Jenkins platform on a various, various persona uh, kind of thing. So, so the way I see my portfolio is a lot of developer stuff, most of the developer stuff actually lands up from us in open source, and most of the administrator stuff lands in the CJP platform with us. So what we are going to do is bring in the notion of these surfaces to various administrators and various job types in, in the CJP land. And the one big thing that we're going to start off with is this notion of organizations. So if you think about how you sort of manage Jenkins today on, on if you're on the Jenkins thing, you're, you're, you're using views or you just have one view with a you know, large number of jobs. And uh, there's folders, and we, we open source folders a few years ago. But uh, in the most recent years, years, years uh, GitHub has introduced this notion of organizations for projects, and developers seem to really like it. So we are actually embracing that model. And so going forward, we'll bring in the notion of organizations, and uh, it can actually help us solve 
you know, interesting things, right? So right from onboarding, you can tell us you know, what's the size of the project that you're bringing on board, and we can use PSC to efficiently allocate resources underneath for you. And the way you interact with Jenkins kind of becomes very organization focused, right? So it becomes very contextual. So I have the ops organization that has 23 users and it has a number of pipelines in it. And you can sort of go into that con context and do more. Our RBAC feature will sort of evolve to be in and around organizations. And uh, the best part is as you're sort of interacting with this, you can context switch into the projects and, and think about and interact within the context of this project. The, the one other thing that I'm excited about is this one ring to sort of rule them all. So if, if you are on CJP today, if you're our customer, and you're managing all these masters, what ends up happening is you land up on CJOC, the operations center, and you navigate your way to the master and so on. With this one URL to rule them all, what we think is everybody would just land on your individualized dashboard, right? And uh, that just makes it exciting, so you don't have to kind of go down this path of you know, uh, trying to find your information. And it's built on top of this, uh, this very popular feature in uh, Blue Ocean called personalizations, which Kosuke demoed. Right? So the way this would work is uh, you are selecting the jobs that you care about, and you know, Jenkins remembers what this is. On the CJP land, what ends up happening is you go into various organizations, you know which organizations you care about. You select your pipelines, and suddenly the next time you log in, you know you see all your jobs right up up front. Right? So that's like the one uh, really exciting thing that we're thinking of working on. Moving on on continuous delivery, I'd like to hand to Kosuke at this point. Okay, so what are we thinking about going ahead for the continuous delivery? So one problem that I really want to solve is today when I go see people's Jenkins instances, sometimes there are just too much details. Like I need, always need to ask people how they are put together. Jobs and bills are often just too much low level details. It's a little bit of like trying to see all the V's that's going left and right, and then from there trying to deduce how the hive as a whole is doing. So we need to kind of up-level things a little bit so that we can make the busy developers and the product managers get the question that they need answered. So we think we can do that by making Jenkins a little bit smarter. So we're gonna first teach Jenkins that there are these, oh, I'm sorry, I guess I went ahead of myself. So the question that I wanted Jenkins to be able to answer rapidly is things like this. So imagine you're an engineering manager, right? So you, know, you have a team of people working on it and you notice that something bad happened, like you know, the, the, the ball turned red. So what you want to know is, is, is somebody already working on the fix for it, and is that already committed? If the fix is already landing, how long does it take for that to come through to the point of the failure, et cetera? And that today requires a lot of too much digging to find that. You know, what about the fear developer? You landed a big change in the master. You, know, you haven't heard anything from Jenkins. Is that because your test had successfully passed? Or is that because your test hasn't simply run yet? And that's an important question for you because that decides whether you can you know, go out for lunch or head home or not. So these are the kind of questions that you know, we want to answer. And then for that, I need to make Jenkins a little bit smarter. So the first step, I think, is to we, we make the Jenkins aware that there are these things called applications, something that's a little bigger and more abstract that uh, you care about. And these applications have a number of different environments. So imagine dev, staging, production, that kind of things. And it is these changes, be it tickets or commits, that are going through this environment from the point of commit to production. And you know, basically, most of the question then boils down to, well, you know, where are my changes in this, in this context? And then finally, to tie it all together, at various key points in Jenkins jobs or pipelines, you could say, well, when the execution hits this point, what, it, 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 it is, what, what it's really doing is to push the changes into certain environment. So with that little bit of additions that you teach Jenkins, for example, what if we can give you some screens like this where uh, you can see all the environments and all the applications on side, and then to see exactly which changes are running where. 
right? So the, if, you, I'm a, if you are like a developer like me, this commit number would immediately speak to me. No, I'm just kidding. But um, if, you're I mean, if you're an engineering manager, you know, we can also sort of crunch the number a little bit and then see, like, massage this commit into something a little more tangible that you could understand, like a version number. Or and if you click any of the, the sort of double click any of the cell and expand it, then we can sort of give you more information about what's actually running in that environment compared to, let's say, previous one or the previous deployment. And these are useful information in case of failure to understand what went wrong. Um, or if you just focus on one specific application, then what I think we, what would be really powerful is for Jenkins to truly understand for any given change issue in the application exactly where it is. All right, so you can see in this case, like uh, some of the changes here um, are waiting for the, you know, are, are committed but not built yet, and then it looks like, oh, there's some bad things happened in the unit test. So uh, there's this in particular one change that has broken it, and then it looks like uh, the change, the follow-up changes are coming there, so maybe you shouldn't panic just yet. Um, or here, there's something here waiting for the, somebody's attention to be able to get to the deployment to the staging environment. Um, and that sort of things. So this gives you like a very comprehensive view of how your changes are, and then that helps you answer a lot of questions like I mentioned earlier. Now, the, um, the, the other thing about the CD is, well, we continue, as we continue to solve this problem in open source space, uh, you know, we need to also make the CD rather easier. Right? So you know, we really think a lot more people need to be doing this, and that means the CD itself needs to be made easier for that to work. So, um, you know, Blue Ocean and Pipeline are the one of the sort of key efforts that for us to, to make CD even easier. And that is, so this is primarily for us the open source effort. Now, the other thing about the continuous delivery, I think, is the continued rise of the containers. So it's becoming more and more important part of the, our stories and then for your story as well, I think. So exactly what, do we, what are we trying to do here? So I think the first one, is we need to split this notion of the uh, build agent as a container. Well, so that's something actually. It, the build agent as a container is something we already do, but we need to take it to the next step by splitting the instance size, which is, you know, think of it as a slice of computer that runs your build. So it's like a CPU, amount of CPU and memory. That's something administrator needs to control. And then divide that up from uh, the actual image used to run the build. Those things could be controlled by the developers in the product team. After all, they know exactly what, they, what the tool they need to run. And then so by making Jenkins aware of those two things, the administrator and then the developer can sort of rein what they need to do and then bring things together to actually instantiate the build agents. Another thing we are working very hard on is to make the build agent smarter and faster. So this mainly involves like a cache in the workspace. So in PSC, um, now we want to make sure that the, when you have a next build, it picks up the whatever compilation result that happened in the previous build, and that would massively speed up the build time and test execution time. And the similar technology can be used for caching and failure diagnosis, so those are useful as well. Now, the, the management, so next is the management at scale features. Now, if you think about how you manage your Jenkins masters today, maybe you have just one, two, or five, or 10. Um, you probably think of individual masters as some, like an individual with different characters. Like it's probably owned by different teams. They might have different plugins. They have experts that have specific use case for these things. So the scaling, in this kind of context, the managing Jenkins at scale is a little bit tricky because uh, there's always this ragtag bunch of people you have to hard. So there's a fundamental cat herding problem. Harpreet mentioned about organizations. What we are trying to do is really sort of push this individuality of different teams into the organizations, into something that's more user-facing, and then keep masters more for the administrator of the cluster. So what that would enable us, what this duality would enable us, is the masters, the pool of masters, could behave more uniformly and consistently. So it becomes more about like a stream troopers so you can only, where you only need to worry about them in certain numbers. Um, so in this kind of world, I think the configuration as code is a critical technology. So we already, I already talked about uh, the basics of it in my keynote, but where I think the CJP can add value on is uh, make more holistic experience. Things like uh, the, um, uh, things like, uh, you know, letting you put these files into the Git repositories, use the branches and directory more effectively, uh, and um, perhaps, 
most importantly, you know, what we can do is to do the canary deployment of new changes across different masters. So uh, the CloudBees Jenkins Enterprise distribution gives, already gives you a fairly significant boost in the stability, but the same thing is now you're gonna get, you're gonna enjoy the same benefit for your configuration changes. That's the earliest point in which we notice the failure. What if we can roll back these changes so that the cluster as a whole would operate quite nicely? So um, the, those are the kind of the management and scale features we are working on. And the, the final one is the web scale Jenkins. So really, like, you know, our aim is to help you create like a one global Jenkins service that spreads the handles the entire need of the organizations uh, for 24 seven. Right, so you saw the, so what's our effort here? You know, scaling up continues to be a, an effort. So you saw our numbers in the keynote, so that's pretty good. But uh, this kind of thing pushes a lot of stress on different places. So we need to work on actually like ironing out of the kinks. Um, or how about uh, the availability zone awareness, right? If you are deploying large number of masters, then it'd be kind of nice if you can make sure that they are evenly spread out into different availability zones, so a single failure doesn't take down the whole thing. And the next level up is, well, if you're a global enterprise, then you probably have different teams running on different projects from different sites. So what if they, their organization lands on the, the master that's running nearby, the builds happening close to their masters are? So that kind of like a smarter things behind the scene to help you, you know, scale up is something we are really trying to work on. So that's sort of like a quick tour on the on their plan coming forward, and then I want to hand it back to Happy to wrap it up. All right. It's actually a question that I ask Kosuke during these presentations, and it's very hard to ask questions to Kosuke that he cannot answer. When is this going to be delivered? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, jokes apart. Uh, wrapping up, so if there's only two things you take out uh, from here today, um, what we do is ops at scale and continuous delivery, right? We've moved the dial quite a bit forward with PSC on what you can do today, and we are going to push that forward. And continuous delivery, you've seen all our investments in blue ocean and pipelines, and that's just going to continue as we go along. So as a next step, I would ask you to you know, stop by at the CloudBees booth. We are a fun bunch, and look forward to talking to you there. Thank you.